The new global framework on chemicals, adopted end of 2023, provides a vision for a planet free of harm from chemicals and waste. What is needed from strategic actors like industry, politicians and private investors to transform our current industry model towards a more sustainable business model and circular economy? That is something I will discuss with Olivier Baldin from UNEP and James Leu from ERM. Welcome. Olivier, on behalf of UNEP, you were involved in setting up the new global framework of chemicals as a successor to SICIM, the strategic approach to international chemicals management. Can you explain the main objectives of the global framework on chemicals? As you mentioned, SICIM, maybe it's, uh, it's good to quickly introduce the, the previous framework. Uh, so it's also a policy framework focusing on, uh, on chemical management and uh, helping countries to um, yeah, basically develop a sound uh, global uh, chemical management. Uh, it uh, expired in 2020. Uh, it had the goal of uh, uh, minimizing the, the, the impact of hazardous chemicals uh, by 2020. Uh, obviously, we're now in 2024, and unfortunately, that goal has not been met. Uh, so uh, we are now with, with this new framework, uh, the, the Global Framework on Chemicals, that was adopted in, in September last year in, in Germany. Uh, and we have just, uh, just started with the, with the framework then. Uh, so the, the main goal of, uh, of this new framework is, uh, as I mentioned, it's very similar, is to uh, uh, protect uh, people and, uh, and the environment from the, the danger of, uh, of harmful chemicals. Um, and uh, it, it's really about the entire life cycle as well. So it's uh, making sure that, uh, I mean, we have chemicals everywhere now. It's in every product that we use. It's an uh, integral part of our societies. Uh, so it's really to make sure that uh, from where we, we make them, we use them, and we dispose of the chemicals, that uh, there's no negative impact, again, on people or the environment. Uh, but it's also, uh, on the positive side, not just about monitoring or keeping an eye on harmful chemicals, but also on uh, promoting safer alternatives, uh, smarter ways to, to design products, and smarter ways to, to, to work, and to share the knowledge uh, with all the stakeholders to make sure that we are all on the same page. And uh, I mean, maybe I should just highlight uh, some numbers. So we, we know that uh, there's been some estimates that there's about or over 2 million lives are lost every year due to uh, chemical pollution. And also the, the World Bank has estimated that just uh, lead poisoning, for example, uh, cost us 4% of the GDP uh, globally. So it's uh, quite significant. Absolutely. Um, what role can stakeholders across various sectors play in achieving the framework's vision for planet free of harm from chemicals and waste? Um, yeah, so here I think it's a very unique feature of the, the global framework on chemicals compared to other agreements or, or framework, and that's been inherited from, from SICAM as well. It's a truly multi-stakeholder uh, framework, so it's been crafted by uh, government, uh, the private sector, uh, international organizations, um, NGO, civil society, academia, youth, so it's, it's really very, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, very uh, multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, so everybody, all the stakeholders have their um, a key role to play to make it a success. So of course you have uh, governments, they have to uh, develop rules and regulations and enforce them. Uh, the private sector will have to, to comply, but also to, to innovate and then to make sure that they find uh, better, more sustainable ways to, to operate. Uh, NGOs can uh, spread information about the danger of chemicals maybe and uh, keep the pressure on government and, and, and uh, private sector. Uh, academia, they can of course do research on the chemicals, the, the impact and effects, uh, how we are exposed and also find better solutions. And um, yeah, and then uh, again you have the international organizations like the, the UN, the, the World Health Organization for example, who can help countries uh, to, in providing any tools they need and also if there's any uh, chemical issues that are cross-border then they can also support the different countries. So okay, well, it seems that the global framework on chemicals is very ambitious. Uh, we in Europe, have, we have the Green Deal, that's already very challenging. What are the challenges in implementing the global framework on chemicals, and especially in developing countries uh, with emerging economies? Maybe James, you can take that? Yes, I think uh, this uh, global framework provides a, a very uh, um, strong guide, guideline uh, for, uh, for the uh, regulatory development agenda going forward. I think for, uh, from the Asian perspective, uh, various country government, when they sign up with this framework, they will need to comply and follow this guideline. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, time will require for the country government to review and maybe potentially revise their domestic rules and regulation to comply and then can be uh, report. So um, it will take time, but 
from an, an industry perspective, um, chemical companies or, or manufacturers they export product to uh, North America or in Europe, they are feeling more urgent pressures from their customer uh, because they have to comply rules of regulation and like the EU Green Deal. So has, hence, they have to take ac action faster in order to maintain their market position. Okay, Olivier, I mean, uh, you're French, but you're living in Thailand. So what is your uh, perspective on this challenge for emerging uh, economies? Um, yes, and we've been part of many negotiations also and, and, and conferences, and so we, we get the, the, the input and the, the insights of, of the emerging economies as well. I think there's obviously lots of roadblocks in implementing the, the framework. Uh, one I can think of is uh, resources, uh, so lack of resources, especially financial, of course. Um, so that they might not have the, the financial resources or the infrastructures, the organizations to, to have proper chemicals management and, and regulations. Uh, they, they, they might uh, not have the, the know-how as well, and uh, so a bit of uh, capacity is needed. Um, they might not have enough uh, trained people or the organization to also enforce the, the regulations. Uh, and especially, I think, in those countries, a lot of uh, turnover with regard to, to staff and so on, so it's also difficult to, to keep the knowledge. Um, yeah, so an, and also maybe another one would be a uh, lack of data, uh, knowing what kind of uh, chemicals are produced in a country, in what quantities, uh, which ones are being used and how, how, they can, how the population can be um, exposed, what are the effects. So if the country don't have to, that kind of data, then it's very difficult to make a smart decision as well. Uh, so it really, again, requires all the stakeholders to work together to, to help the, the emerging economies to uh, uh, implement yeah, safe sound management system. Okay. Would it be possible for emerging economies to jumpstart towards a more sustainable and circular industry by skipping a few steps? Uh, yeah, I think of course, and uh, that's probably something that we wish, uh, <laughs> obviously. Uh, so we, we don't want uh, every country to go through the, the same uh, steps. Uh, I think with regard to sustainability, we, we can think about maybe the emerging economies could focus on yeah, more sustainable industry, uh, more uh, resource efficient. Uh, so then instead of, for example, um, investing in uh, a conventional fossil fuel based uh, industry processes, they could go towards renewable energies right away, uh, for focusing maybe on, on solar and wind. Uh, when you talk about circular industry, I think as well, it would be very important that, uh, that those countries uh, skip a bit the linear model that we are used to with the take, make, dispose and uh, creating a lot of uh, waste. So implementing uh, circular uh, principles, uh, focusing on, on products that uh, reduce the need for materials, uh, reuse as much as possible and uh, at the end of the line, if not possible, also have recycling possibilities. So having um, resource uh, efficient management systems uh, and, and waste management uh, strategies as well is very important. And then uh, finally, I think um, thinking about uh, digital uh, technologies as well, uh, maybe implant, implementing digital products, tools or platform within the value chain can also probably make things uh, more efficient and, and more sustainable. Okay, uh, James, from a business perspective, anything to add here? Yes, I, I think it's possible because I think uh, over the past decades, uh, uh, as the world evolved, uh, new technology, new approach, new concept uh, have been developed primarily from North America, Europe, and then transformed into uh, Asia uh, because of the supply chain. So, but uh, one thing importantly, as uh, Olivia mentioned earlier, I think in Asia, uh, in some aspect, we are still lag behind uh, due to lack of resources, insufficient experience. Hence, there is a, a, a requirement to collaborate across industry, not just the chemical industry, but uh, including the manufacturing industry using chemical, uh, like the high-tech sector, like the automobile sector, and industry needs to work with various stakeholders, including the country government, uh, the, the uh, waste recycling reuse industry, or sustainability solution provider to uh, come to a solution and move faster in this direction. Olivier, you mentioned knowledge is essential. How does the framework address the life cycle of chemicals, including production, use and disposal, to minimize adverse impacts on health and the environment? Uh, yes, yeah, so as you mentioned, I think the global framework uh, on chemicals really focuses on the entire life cycle of chemicals. Uh, I think it's even uh, in the name, we're focusing on, on chemicals and waste. 
Um, and then it does that through uh, different key mechanisms. Uh, so for example, the, the framework um, promotes uh, risk assessment and risk management. Uh, so it's important to, to do comprehensive risk assessment of, of chemicals to identify the potential hazards, to evaluate them, uh, and then based on the information, you can uh, implement uh, proper risk management uh, measures uh, throughout the life cycle. So either to, to prevent the risk or to mitigate or to, to reduce the risks. So that includes uh, protecting um, vulnerable workers and, and, and other gr groups uh, yes. in health issues, for so instance. that would be during manufacturing, of course, and then the worker, as you mentioned, but also for the people at the end of the line, maybe managing waste and uh, also the, the public being exposed to in, in products and, and so on. Uh, the sharing of information, of course, is also promoted uh, in, in the framework. So that would be throughout the value chain as well, again, during production. Uh, having proper labeling uh, on the packaging, etc., to have the right information um, yeah, to manage chemicals during the life cycle. Uh, I think there's a strong emphasis also on uh, producer responsibility, uh, product stewardship, uh, making sure that uh, manufacturers have, uh, take responsibility for their products, again, throughout the life cycle, during the use and, uh, and disposal as well. So maybe it could, uh, James, that you add a little bit on the product stewardship strategies here in Asia that helps in this transformation. Yes, I think uh, in, in, in respect to product stewardship, this has become a hot topic uh, in, in Asia. For example, uh, a country like uh, Korea, Taiwan, China, we all uh, implement the rich like, e rich like regulation that drives the um, the changes in the industry and more, uh, you know, information needs to be provided to the uh, government uh, and be more transparent. And throughout the process, uh, already there are many uh, data useful information uh, uh, already exist in Europe, and th this data can be used, utilized in Asia, so enable the industry to catch up uh, and meet the requirement faster. So this will help for the industry in the transformation journey. Okay, and in what ways does the framework encourage the private sector, for instance, eh, to transform towards sustainable chemistry, circular economies, and what are the expected outcomes of such a transformation? I think for the, the industry, they are, um, because this guideline, uh, this framework provides a, a useful guideline, but oftentimes we see uh, for example, in Asia, real change comes from two dimensions. One is the, the in-country regulation. They adopt the, the, this framework has been translated into the national regulation. And the second dimension is from the customer requirement. And oftentimes we found that customer request, pressure, come faster than the country regulation. And hence, they have to take proactive uh, action, adopt this uh, concept the sustainable chemistry, a circular economy, uh, recycling, not only to, uh, uh, to meet the requirement, but also maintain their market position and be able to export and continue in the business uh, going forward. Okay, Olivier, what do you see as the outcomes of the transformation? Um, you know, I think maybe just back to, to your the previous question, I think it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's a multi stakeholder framework, so industry and private sector is, has been part of the negotiation, and they, they also have their own uh, targets, and uh, so I think it's uh, important for industry and private sector to really uh, be proactive in, in implementing the, the framework and not just uh, wait for regulation and, uh, and governments to, to, uh, to implement regulation. Uh, but yes, I think very similar to, uh, to what has been said, the, um, I think we see uh, we want the industry to, uh, to improve, to, uh, to be more sustainable, and uh, we need to, to, to make products that are safe and beneficial, uh, both for them, of course, for, as a business, but uh, for people and the planet as well. Okay. My science teacher always said, a problem well stated is half solved. What challenges can companies face during this transformation towards a more sustainable value chain? Yes, I think one of the key uh, issues is the, um, the management and communication of data through the supply chain. Um, and this brings the, the issue of transparency, right? Um, and now many companies or suppliers in Asia, for example, they have been asked to provide data information. They have never been asked had to provide. And hence, 
uh, how to communicate and provide uh, data throughout the per, uh, supply chain uh, with all the key stakeholders. So everybody understand what's required uh, and, and so I, they can meet the requirement. This, this is important. So I think in, on the journey of uh, low carbon economy transition, uh, data management and sharing throughout the supply chain are key. And so there are uh, digital tools uh, that can be adopted uh, for the company to, uh, to manage this process more efficiently, more accurately and that helped to achieve the goal. Okay, thank you. Olivier, you already mentioned uh, before that funding and financial aspects might be challenging for uh, emerging countries, but the global framework of chemicals also has a budget somehow for that, I believe. Eh? Um, there's, uh, yes, so there's, there's um, a global framework from chemical funds that has been uh, reinstated. It's a successor of, uh, of the QSP from SICAM, the Quick Start Program. Uh, where countries could apply for funding for uh, projects to support the development of, uh, of uh, yeah, chemical management systems. So there's, uh, the, the fund is brand new, there's been some donations already, so uh, now I think the, the Secretariat uh, of UNEP, uh, also of the framework, uh, is really busy in, uh, in uh, operationalizing the fund. So there's been a, a few bureau meetings already to discuss the, the terms and conditions for the funds, how, how to apply uh, for and uh, what kind of projects should, uh, sh should be funded and so on. So this is maybe the, the main priority now is to really activate this fund. Yeah, so basically that is one of the challenges for which there's already a solution. What other challenges do you see for uh, going towards the transformation? Yeah, uh, if, if we go back to, uh, to uh, industry, I think, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, data and uh, transparency, so of course, can, could be a challenge, uh, especially maybe for companies who don't have a very uh, strong uh, management system for, for collecting and reporting on data. Um, as you mentioned also, the, the supply chain, complex supply chain, it might be also a challenge to, to monitor and have control and or influence on your uh, suppliers, making sure that they do everything in a, in a sustainable way. Uh, of course, cost could be an issue. Uh, investing in uh, new technologies, new, uh, new equipment uh, that can be in conflict maybe with the short-term goals of, uh, of, uh, of profit. Uh, so obviously cost is a big one. And um, technology, uh, technological barriers, uh, having access to the technology that you need uh, that meets your requirements, especially maybe in, uh, in developing countries. Uh, and obviously also regulatory compliance could be challenging for some uh, companies, maybe especially the big ones that uh, operate internationally with different jurisdictions, different regulations. So how do you make sure that you comply with uh, all those different uh, requirements? Okay, thank you. Olivier, you already mentioned that investments are important. James, special disruption challenges can be foreseen eh, for traditional brownfield business models. They need to become more sustainable and greener. Do you have any suggestions how these companies can balance their current operations while investing in new sustainable practices? Yes, perhaps I can uh, use an example to, uh, uh, to answer this question. I think uh, it's a public knowledge and well-known case in, uh, for the uh, PFAS contamination at, uh, at the uh, 3M facility in Belgium, which uh, attract uh, a huge public attention. Um, in the process, uh, there are pressures from all directions, including the regulatory scrutiny, uh, pressures from the cus uh, customer, uh, media exposure, uh, and also uh, uh, pressure from the public, local community, and even their employee. Um, so it's important to come up with a strategy to uh, address this uh, concern uh, while uh, clean up the contamination issue at this brownfield operation. So it's important to, uh, I think the lesson learned is that it's important to maintain, um, to be open and maintain transparency, um, keeping a, a good uh, communication with the key stakeholder, manage the expectation, uh, and then implement a strategy to overcome the problem. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, for the operation, it's also important to review um, and the, the sourcing, uh, you know, you know, program and consider the needs of changing uh, material, production material, and while continue engage with the, the regulator and the supply chain. So uh, I think for the uh, the brownfield operation, uh, in view of the uh, emerging regulations uh, requirement. Uh, it's important for the industry or for the company to 
to carry out a self-assessment uh, as early as possible, understand where are the pinch points, and, and come up with a strategy, take proactive action to address that, not to wait until it becomes a problem. And throughout the process, also taking the advantage to see uh, where are potential ways for, for the transformation uh, to move faster on this journey. Yeah. I think it's a clear example and also uh, stressing that transformation is also an opportunity. I think that's good. You come up with a European example and to be very clear on what is happening, uh, uh, there is sometimes a cultural difference when we place it here in the Asian uh, region. Do you think that uh, here they have that same perspective and they can implement the same way? Uh, yes, because uh, I think uh, the many Western multinational companies, they also have operation in, in, in Asia and they have interact closely with their uh, the peers or their supplier in Asia and they are lesson learned. I think for the Asian uh, company, they will look what happened elsewhere and then think about themselves, whether they have, might have similar problem. And uh, because a lot of Asian company, they are export oriented company, they export product uh, everywhere. So they have to uh, think ahead and understand what's required uh, and then take actions to address that. So I think that can help the A Asian company to catch up faster. That's very good, uh, James. Thank you very much for that. Olivier, meeting the growing consumer demands and expectations for sustainable products and practices, they can also be challenging. But it's also encouraging eh, that the consumers are asking for things. What is your perspective on this? Uh, yeah, I think my perspective is uh, quite positive. Uh, as you mentioned, I think it, it can push companies to, to innovate, uh, to also to... Um, uh, to kind of differentiate their products and uh, their companies within a very uh, competitive market. As you mentioned, the consumers, they really seek out brands that, are, that align with their values, uh, with the sustainability principles. So I think those companies that will embrace uh, more sustainable operations, uh, they will be able to uh, develop a better brand reputation, uh, probably, uh, greater um, uh, consumer loyalty as well. So uh, it will definitely help their, their business. Uh, I, th I think also this, this push from consumers that will, uh, as I mentioned, help companies innovate, uh, develop new products, new business models maybe, uh, so, and, and also help them maybe uh, keeping ahead of uh, regulatory compliance. So, uh, yeah, I think it, probably the, the consumer demands and requirements are usually a bit uh, uh, ahead of the, the regulatory requirements. Uh, so definitely that would reduce the risk of uh, maybe fines or, or sanctions from, from regulations and, uh, and again, uh, yeah, rehabilitational damage as well. So uh, I think definitely the, the companies that will uh, focus on sustainability and, uh, and yeah, embracing sustainability uh, will position themselves uh, for success in the long term. Okay, um, James, you're also one of the consumers here. Uh, what is your perspective? I think uh, for the, um, because of the growing public awareness, uh, especially younger generation, they now see the uh, you know, climate change is real, uh, sustainability, ESG are critical. So when they uh, purchase product services, more and more they will look into this aspect and they will look at the company who provide a service or product, whether they have adopt a similar uh, concept, idea, uh, approach. And for the company, this could be a great opportunity to, uh, to leverage, uh, create a competitive uh, advantage. Uh, and by uh, taking uh, proactive action, uh, like uh, reduce the product carbon footprint as an example, or um, you know, reduce the energy consumption, bring in uh, renewable energy, uh, and help to um, uh, you know, strengthen the, the, the sustainability of the product or services will help uh, to win a customer, consumer heart. Yeah, <laughs> that's nicely stated. Technological developments supporting sustainability implementation are important. Keeping up with the latest technologies for sustainability, such as digitalization and automation, requires continuous learning and adaptation. Is this addressed in or stimulated by the Global Framework on Chemicals? Um, somehow. So I think the, the Global Framework is, is more um, yeah, focusing on, on policy development, on uh, international collaboration and so on, so not uh, specifically on, on technology, but I think it uh, enables uh, 
or oh yeah, encourage uh, technology development and, uh, and, and spread of information as well. So I think, again, there's a few key mechanisms or, or features of the framework. Uh, one is the focus on capacity building and training, so helping especially developing countries uh, to, to learn about the latest technologies and, and the best way to operate. Um, strong emphasis on, on sharing of knowledge and data, as we already mentioned, so that also should uh, include uh, information and knowledge about best uh, practices, guidelines, new technologies uh, between countries, but also from, from the private sector. Uh, there's also a strong focus on the, on the cleaner production, on the, on the safer products, safer alternatives. So that should also uh, include uh, newer technologies. And also the framework uh, aligns very well with other key initiatives like the uh, Sustainable Development Goals from the, from the UN and the, or the Paris Agreement. So again, focusing on, on the, the newest and, and best technologies. Uh, so it, it's not uh, directly um, yeah, focusing on, on technology development, but I think it, it uh, enables and creates uh, an environment where uh, technology and uh, new technologies should be uh, uh, included. Okay, so some transformation is already on the horizon, uh, but some success stories can be shared, I guess, already from SICOM, from the Global Framework on Chemicals, and maybe some other initiatives that already led to significant improvements in the chemical safety and sustainability. So, James, could you share one of those success stories? Yes, I think uh, uh, the, for, for chemical management, uh, uh, many companies, they have uh, sort of uh, already have existing um, ERP, the information management platform within the company. Now, with the increasing pressure and demand uh, to manage more diversified uh, issues like the chemical management, like the energy consumption, greenhouse gas emission, we have seen companies start moving into a direction to enhance their uh, uh, information platform to adopt and, and incorporate those new requirements. And just these two days, I think in Taipei, we, uh, in Taiwan, Taipei, we have a big uh, Computex. And you probably saw the news, uh, the CEO of uh, NVIDIA is, you know, you know, you know broadcasting the, 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 the future direction for uh, AI, generative AI. And so I think uh, digitalization, uh, using the digital tools uh, solution in managing the, 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 the uh, industrial operation, including chemical management, will be a future direction. And companies should uh, be open and embrace um, and, and take the advantage uh, going forward. Great. Some success stories from you, Olivier? Uh, yeah, so I think with regard to the global framework, it's, uh, it's a bit too early. It's uh, still very new, so there's maybe not so many stories to, to tell there. Uh, SICAM, uh, of course, uh, was more focusing on uh, coordinated efforts and collaboration, uh, not specifically on implementation of, of, uh, of actions. But there's, there's a few uh, success stories that, that uh, we can mention. I think especially in, uh, in developing countries, uh, they have uh, developed uh, national action plans or regional action plans. So really helping, especially in Asia, Euro, um, Asia sorry, Africa and Latin America, uh, develop, uh, yeah, laying down the strategies for chemicals management and really helping at the, the local level. Um, we, we've had uh, very good collaboration and partnerships. Uh, one that we can mention is the, the Global Alliance for Lead in Paint. Uh, we, have, um, well, we have tried to, to, yeah, to, to help countries uh, raise awareness, uh, develop regulation and find uh, safer alternatives to, uh, to lead in paint. And um, we, the QSP, as I mentioned, the Quick Start Program has uh, supported the uh, country with uh, funding 184 projects. And uh, finally, I think, um, yeah, the SICAM has developed and shared a lot of uh, tools, uh, chemical assessment tools. Uh, we can think about the RMC toolbox, for example. Um, but also we, are, we have now a project uh, to support uh, countries in Africa to implement GHS uh, for classification and labeling. So yeah, a few small success stories that we can share. Now, great to see already some success today. Looking ahead, what are the targets and next steps for the Global Framework on Chemicals to strengthen its impact on sustainable value chain development? So what kind of implementation directions and momentum do you see evolving, uh, Olivier? Um, yeah, I think what we can see now is uh, really a uh, growing uh, interconnection between chemical management, uh, environmental sustainability and also human well-being. So there, there's uh, really a strong momentum now uh, for action at all levels, uh, national, international, but also corporate levels. 
Uh, and some of the key drivers there are, as we mentioned, the, the growing awareness from the public on the, the risk uh, and concern about chemicals, uh, but also technology development, of course, um, uh, regulation, evolving regulation and the, the market dynamics. So it's a, a few, few drivers there. Uh, so it's really important we keep that momentum and that we, we act now and that we uh, implement the, the framework. And uh, I think what's really important in next steps will be the continued collaboration and commitment from all the stakeholders, as I mentioned. Uh, so that uh, we really can have a global industry that is, again, safe, sustainable and uh, beneficial for people and the planet. Sounds great. James? Yes, I think, the, again, this uh, framework provides a, a good guidelines for um, globally. Uh, and I think it, it's important that the, the country government uh, who signed up and uh, adopt this guideline uh, will need to transform the framework requirement into the country regulation. And I think uh, we can see that uh, EU is driving the future direction uh, activity. The, the EU Green Deal, under the EU Green Deal, there are requirements for like corporate sustainability reporting directive, which actually have impact or influence not only in Europe, across the globe. Uh, across the globe. Um, so uh, now uh, we have seen like some of the Asian um, increasing Asian uh, company, they are concerned about that. Uh, they've been asked by their customer in the EU regarding the um, what what's their performance uh, in the relation to the uh, corporate sustainability due diligence directive in supply chain. And hence, uh, for the Asian uh, company, it's important to understand what are the requirements and look at their own operation. They may also have legal presence in the EU. So they themselves have to comply with the requirement. But on the other hand, they are also supplier to the EU customer. So they have to look at their custom, uh, supply chain as well. So uh, it's important to, I think for the, 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 the industry, because, because they're, they're changing regulation and upcoming uh, international framework requirement uh, is increasing. So it's important for them to track, understand what's coming and look at their, uh, where are their key market, their business strategy in the next five, 10 years, and then they prepare to uh, address those issues uh, and come up with the strategy and roadmap to implement accordingly so they can uh, uh, maintain their position in the market going okay. forward, yeah. Okay, yeah. so make a roadmap and be prepared. Olivier and James, Thanks for helping set things in motion. We can conclude that to implement the goals of the Global Framework on Chemicals, a strategic approach, commitment from leadership, and a willingness to innovate and adapt to new business models is essential. For all companies that aim to achieve and implement long-term sustainability goals with a positive impact on the environment and society, it is time to transform and roll out. Mm -hmm.